on of the committee on small business and entrepreneurship is going to will come to order and I want to thank everyone for, for joining us here today I want to welcome both secretary Mnuchin and administrator Carranza I want to thank you both for uh, being here though far away uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all the members for being here today. This is our first opportunity to hear from both of you about the enactment of the CARES Act, in particular as it applies to small business. The CARES Act is uh, landmark legislation. In less than two weeks, uh, Congress passed the largest economic relief package in our nation's history. And now, after the passage of two further reforms, the Paycheck Protection Program is the largest component of the economic relief enacted by the, by the CARES Act. Act. On, on that, that point, point, I just I want, want to say, say a couple, couple things. things. First of all, it was uh, the extraordinary uh, work, work of many people, many people uh, staff, staff, of course, worked, worked tirelessly uh, to make this make possible. possible. The partnership, the partnership we had from both uh, the uh, SBA and, and the Treasury was, was extraordinary. extraordinary. Uh, members, members on this committee, every, every single one participated. One obviously, the leadership of the ranking member, Senator Cardin, of Senator Shaheen, and, uh, and, of, and of Senator Collins was not a member of the committee, but was part of our task force and, and really was invaluable in helping craft a lot of this. And I want the record to reflect that uh, with the consent of the ranking member, we have invited Senator Collins to sit with the committee during today's hearing and participate, and rightfully so, because of her extraordinary contribution as, in many ways, uh, the foundation of many of the ideas that became law. Um, so. I thought, I thought it was important, important to make that, that point, point that for those who have lost faith in our ability of government to respond in a time of crisis and in a time for national unity, I hope, I hope you'll take some hope in the fact that that, uh, that, that happened when it came to this. It would have been impossible without it. Uh, after we did that, it was up to the administration, particularly Secretary Mnuchin, who has been extraordinarily accessible, as every member that's been involved can, can tell, say. Administrator Carranza has had an incredible amount of work to do. Uh, to uh, ex execute and administer the Paycheck, the Paycheck Protection Program. program. And there and were there bumps were along the road. The road. No, no one, one would say there wasn't. There wasn't. But, but overall, the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program has, has been, been, in my opinion, opinion an extraordinary success. success. Um, uh, it, it is, is by, by far, far, in my view, view no, no disrespect, disrespect towards anyone, anyone else, else, by far the most effective and most impactful portion of the CARES Act to date. I think. And, and history, history will look, look back, back at it as an example, example of, of what, what government can do in a time of crisis to be helpful to our country. country. And, and if there's any dispute, dispute about that, that then I want everyone want to ask themselves, what would our economy look like today had there not been a Paycheck Protection Program? program. It, it saved, saved millions, millions of jobs, jobs and small businesses, businesses during, during the single most uncertain economic situation that has existed in the lifetime of anyone in this room and since the Great Depression. It took a new approach. The CARES, the CARES Act was being, as the CARES, the CARES Act, Act was being negotiated, negotiated businesses, if we remember, we remember that, that time, were faced with the prospect of laying off workers, not because of the weakness in their business model or a cyclical downturn in the economy, because the government told them you can't operate, you can't open your doors, you can't take customers, you can't do business. It is, in some respects, the equivalent of a taking, in which government and the public interest intervened and denied people the right to do something. Um, and, and, and we viewed the PPP as what government does when it uses its power to do that, and that is to help and compensate those who are damaged by it. There was with no work available to be done. Pure economic logic told these people in small business that the most efficient thing for them to do was to lay off their workers until more normal conditions were restored. But we knew that the most efficient economic outcome was not the best outcome for the common good. In fact, it would have been catastrophic for our country. And so, so during, during the negotiation of the CARES Act, Act I, for example, example learned about, about an entire, entire family, family, a family that, that I've, I've known, known for many years, years that, that within, within a 72 hour period, the father was laid off, then the mother was laid off, then their two adult kids were laid off, and then the spouses of those two adult kids were laid off. In 72 hours, massive, massive uh, calamity for that family. You can imagine it was just the uncertainty around all this was devastating. And it's, and it's not, not something, something that temporary, temporary replacement of income alone can solve. The situation, the situation by the way, is also bad for small business. Workers are not disposable inputs that can be discarded during tough times. They are integral members of all businesses, but especially of small business. And I have personally heard, as I'm sure many of our members have, from countless small businesses of the anguish, the personal anguish that many of them felt at having to lay off employees, many of whom had worked for them for decades. These were people, people that they, they knew. knew. They knew their families, they knew their children, they had to watch those children grow up, and they knew how much they depended on these jobs to make ends meet. 
What small business needed was not cheaper debt they could, that they could take out against their future earnings. They needed a real lifeline. And what the economy needed was not just only government checks, but it needed to lessen the pain of the layoffs. By, it needed to reduce the layoffs altogether. And it needed, I think, as much as anything else, to preserve the connected tissue of a well-running economy, which at its core is being attached to dignified work. And that's why we did this program. Instead of a traditional loan, the program would have, instead of a, of a traditional loan, small businesses would have whatever cost they spent on the survival of their business forgiven, as long as they kept their workers on payroll. As nationwide lockdowns shut down the economy, we, who worked on this, every member of this committee and those outside of it, had two main priorities. The size of it, we wanted to make sure it reached enough businesses and people, and we needed to do it fast. This was not something we had weeks or months to work on, and I'm proud that both of those goals were met. That the scope of the lockdown meant we needed sizable relief. Initially, the appropriate, well, the appropriated funds for this program are now at $670 billion. It sounds, it is a lot of money. It's larger than any other program enacted by the CARES Act. It's larger than the 2008 stimulus bill. By some estimates, it's the largest program since the New Deal. Um, but the speed of the lockdown also meant we needed to get funds to small businesses quickly. The CARES Act, just to walk everybody through this, was signed into law on March 27th, exactly seven days later, thanks to extraordinary and tireless work, which is easy to criticize for some who are watching from the outside, but we're talking about people that were there overnight, four, five, six, seven in the morning, you know, barely time to, to get home, shower, and change their clothes, thanks to the tireless work of people, of people working, working under Secretary, Secretary Mnuchin and, and the Secretary himself, himself people working under Administrator Carranza and, and herself, himself, the Paycheck the Protection Program began approving loans seven days, days after Congress, Congress passed it and the President signed it. it. Small, Small businesses, businesses received PPP funds before, before millions, millions of Americans received tax refunds, before, before people, started people started receiving unemployment checks, checks. And, and other lending, lending programs, programs run through the federal Reserve are only just now beginning to operate. That's not a criticism of those things. That is just to describe the extraordinary effort that it took to stand up a program that didn't exist in just seven days. When this program began on April 3rd, no one on planet Earth had ever made a PPP loan, had ever approved a PPP loan, had ever processed a PPP loan, or had ever applied for one. And in seven days, that began. The achievement of these priorities came at the expense of others. Some companies who should not have received the loans received them. We've read all about it. It shouldn't have happened. They represent a minuscule percentage of the overall program, however, and most have since returned them. Computer systems were strained under unprecedented levels of activity. Guidance released to solve problems created unanticipated problems. But again, I want to be clear. The bumps in the road were and are the price to pay, unfortunately, for, the, for, for a program, program that, that, in hindsight, hindsight we now, now know is among the most successful programs that, that government has ever done to rescue an economy. Economists and financial forecasters predicted last month that May 2020 would be the worst month for job losses during the duration of the pandemic. It was expected, this is what everyone expected, 8 million Americans would lose their jobs in May. They predicted that unemployment would be 20%. Some even speculated that it might end up surpassing the Great Depression. 24% rate, what would, what would that have looked like? And what would that have looked like given everything else that's going on in the world in our country right now? Well, I can tell you on an economic point, it would have bankrupted the central promise of economic opportunity in our nation. Without PPP's temporary lifeline, tens of millions of Americans would have been permanently separated from their livelihoods and stripped for long periods of time from the opportunity of dignified work. Many would quickly be condemned to poverty. Some over generations, parents, would be unable to provide for their families tied indefinitely to government assistance. Without PPP, we would have faced the extinction of small business as we know it. Countless blocks of urban and suburban America would have been hollowed out. Vast expanses of empty lots with brick and mortar stores once sustained communities. It's tough out there. There's still a lot of suffering, economic, pain and of course the pain related to this terrible disease, but the most catastrophic visions did not come to pass. Instead, forecasters, to the surprise of forecasters and everyone, last month, 2.5 million Americans got their jobs back. 
The over $500 billion in Paycheck Protection Program funds dispersed through April and May enabled businesses to keep or to quickly rehire workers as, as conditions allowed. To date, four and a half million American businesses have received loans equal to over $500 billion. And this, we'll know more when the forgiveness begins to come in, but this is equal to 50 million jobs. The average loan size is now down to $112,000, an amount that based on eligibility criteria means that the average business receiving a PPP loan would be one with 10 employees. A recent survey by the National Federation of Independent Businesses noted that 77% of surveyed small business owners had applied for a PPP loan, and of that 77%, 93% had received funding. As of June 6th, there are currently 424 community development financial institutions and minority depository institutions now in the program. They have accounted for more than 190,000 loans valued at $15.8 billion. And the SBA and Treasury have also set aside $10 billion in PPP funds for CDFIs to continue to lend. This is the record of a successful program. And again, I want to thank everyone, the Secretary, the Administrator, all the members of the Senate, and our partners in the House, and of course the President, for not just passing this, but working to implement it. I do want to comment on the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. The SBA, for the first time in its history, administered a nationwide disaster and grant advance program through an expanded version of the, of this, of the EIDL uh, program offering direct government lending and grants to eligible entities suffering injury to, due to the pandemic. To date, the SBA has approved more than 1.13 million loans of these loans, emergency loans, totaling about 79, almost $80 billion, and 3.1 million emergency idle advances, totaling another 10.2 billion. The program has realized numerous challenges, both previously in responding to regional disasters and, of course, under this current one. In drafting the CARES Act, I raised concerns with the deficiencies of the existing IDLE program as a whole, which only accounts for roughly 2% of the disaster loans made by SBA. In particular, I was concerned that it would be challenging for the agency to handle a disaster of this extraordinary magnitude. As such, the concept of using traditional lenders instead of direct government loans to ensure capital is reaching the hands of small businesses as fast as possible was one of the reasons that gave rise to PPP. I commend the agency for standing up the IDLE program nationwide to respond to an unprecedented volume of applications within a very short period of time. Today, unfortunately, we see similar and new IDLE challenges for borrowers, including long processing and disbursement timelines and communication issues. As many businesses are also relying on assistance through IDLE to rebuild after the economic disruptions caused by this pandemic, we look forward to the agency addressing the current IDLE challenges and how Congress, how we on this side, can work to support the agency in making improvements to this program. Today is an oversight hearing. There are many issues that myself and members of this committee would like to raise to help keep this program running smoothly, especially as some businesses approach filing for loan forgiveness as early as this month. But we should begin by putting these issues in perspective and recognizing the choices that Congress and the administration had to make in order to make this program succeed. With that, I now recognize the, the ranking member, Senator Cardin, for his opening statement. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, first, thank you for convening this hearing, but more importantly, thank you for your leadership in the role that this committee has played in a nonpartisan manner in order to help the small businesses of America. This has been a proud moment of our Senate uh, careers in working together to develop three very, very important programs to help, to help small businesses, businesses during COVID-19. We did that in a way that put the interest of our nation first and the interests of small business and, and their workers. Secretary Mnuchin, welcome to the committee. I personally want to thank you for your availability. You have been always available to talk with us to try to work out how this program could be administered in a seamless way. And I thank you for your personal leadership uh, to make, make these, these programs, programs work as effective as we can through the administration and then working with Congress as to, we, as to the need for legislative changes. Uh, Administrator Carranza, please accept our appreciation for the incredible work of your agency. As Senator uh, Rubio pointed out, 
you stood, stood up, up a program, program literally, literally overnight, overnight that has uh, provided 4.5 4. 5 5 million, million loans, loans uh, over $510 billion, billion uh, uh, an incredible, incredible effort, effort, and we thank you very much for the hard work of, of, the, of the members of, of your, of your uh, uh, agency. This committee uh, helped craft, and I was proud to be part of a drafting committee consisting of four senators, Senator Rubio, Senator Collins, who's with us today, Senator Shaheen and myself, that put together and listened to all the members of this committee in the Senate and, and stood off three programs, the PPP program that has received most of the attention, but also the IDLE grant program, uh, as well as the loan forgiveness program. We, when, well, when we initially created the eight-week-long PPP program in March, we thought that our economy would be performing at a more normal level than it is today. So an eight-week period for small businesses to spend their loan seemed reasonable. As communities began, the process of reopening is now clear that many small businesses will not be up and running at the end of the eight-week period, which for many, as Chairman Rubio has pointed out, will occur this month. I was, I was proud, proud to see the Senate, Senate act, act responsibly, responsibly last week, week passing bipartisan, bipartisan legislation that gives businesses with existing and new PPP loans the discretion to use those loans over a 24-week period rather than the eight-week period. PPP is working for many employers. And the May monthly job report released by the Labor Department last Friday is proof of the 2.5 million jobs added back to the American economy last month more than 1.4 million were jobs of employers in the food service industry, many of whom secured loans through our programs. However, the depth of the economic challenge facing this country, the National Bureau of Economic Research announced this week that the United States economy is in a recession and that the unemployment rate remains at a historic high level of 13.3 percent, a level that we have not seen since the Great Depression. For minorities, the unemployment rates are even much higher. While the PPP success is laudable accomplishment, there have been challenges in the program that have come into sharper focus given the massive protests our nation has witnessed over the past two weeks. The protests sparked by the death of George Floyd has raised the awareness of the desperate, disparate public health and economic consequences of COVID-19 pandemic on communities of color black Americans in particular. Civil rights is still the unfinished business in America. More than 50 years ago, the Kernan Commission created by President Lyndon Johnson warned of the negative consequences of continued inequality. That was 50 years ago. The commission wrote in its report that America was headed towards two societies, one black and one white, separate and unequal. Mr. Chairman, there's no question that our country has made strides in the decades since the Kerner Commission released its report, but there remains an economic divide between black and white America. In 1968, a typical middle-class black family had less than one-tenth of the wealth of a typical middle-class white family. It's the same today, and it exists at every level of education attainment. A 2018 report found that there are no actions that America, black Americans can take unilaterally that will have much of an effect on reducing the racial wealth gap. For black small business owners and other underserved entrepreneurs, the wealth gap is even made worse by the difficulty in getting lending. Minority businesses owners are two to three times more likely to be denied loans than non-minority business owners and are more likely to receive less funding and pay higher interest rates on the loans that they do receive. It is with this inequality in mind that Senator Shaheen and I drafted language in the CARES Act instructing the SBA and Treasury to issue guidance to financial institutions participating in the PPP program to prioritize loans from underserved small businesses. We wanted, we wanted to prevent, to prevent history, history from repeating itself because we knew that during the 2008, 20, 2008 financial crisis, small business lending to minority-owned businesses fell dramatically and never fully recovered. Secretary Mnuchin and Administrator Carranza, these well-documented disparities are why I was so disappointed to read in the SBAIG's recent flash report, which was prepared at the request of Senator Schumer, Brown, and myself. The report found that the SBA's implementation of PPP did not fully align 
with congressional intent of the CARES Act because the SBA did not provide guidance on prioritizing underserved and rural markets. Further, the report found that the SBA has failed to collect demographic information for small businesses seeking SBA loans. While I appreciate the SBA will be collecting demographic information on loan for gifts and sworns and a set aside initial $10 billion that the chairman mentioned and Secretary Mnuchin announced in regards to CDFIs, it is important that the SBA follow the Inspector General's call to provide guidance to lenders that, that prioritize underserved markets. Underserved markets often do not have access to traditional banking institutions. That is why the SBA's existing economic injury disaster loan and grant programs are so important. I remain discouraged that these programs, which have great potential to help small businesses seek to adapt to the new reality of the post-COVID economy, have reached fewer small businesses than we had hoped. We're not alone in this. Uh, we have, have a copy of a letter from all the members of the House Small Business Committee, all the Democrats and Republicans, expressing their frustration on the administration of the IDLE program, the slowness of getting grant applications approved, the closing of the window in regards to non-agricultural applications, the arbitrary cap that was put on the program, as well as, as the fact of the lack of transparency. We need to do better. IDLE serves a particular role for businesses. It can be used for working capital needs and may be more desirable for the smallest of small businesses that do not have many employees. The program is especially important for minority-owned and other underserved small businesses which are less likely to have more than one employee and have fewer employees on average. Unfortunately, the administration has not administered IDLE in a manner that makes it a reliable resource for small businesses. The administration has put in place requirements and limitations without notifying borrowers, such as a decision to cap the loans at $150,000, even though the statute allows the loans to go up to $2 million. In May, the administration also made the decision to stop taking applications from non-farm small businesses, meaning restaurants, retailers, and other mom and pa establishments have not had access to IDLE since mid-April. Small businesses are relying on you to make idle loans more accessible. The administration must become more transparent. In the months since the passage of the CARES Act, Congress has been pushing for additional data on who is receiving this aid. And I appreciate that uh, Chairman Rubio and I have joined together in making that request. And we have worked with the administration and we've gotten some of the information, but we need more of the information. We are extremely disappointed to learn that GAO has had the same problems that we have had and has not gotten the information they need to carry out their oversight function in the executive branch, as well as the difficulties we have in the legislative branch. How can we know which businesses still need help if we do not know which businesses have received help? Senator Kuhn, Shaheen, and I are pursuing legislation to help those most in need to receive additional PPP funding, but we need the data to ensure this assistance is effective as possible. As we, we, we all, I think we all agree there's gonna be a need for a second round, but how do we able to get that second round if we don't have the full information on how the first round is operated? We believe that the aid should go to the smaller of the small businesses. We believe it should go to those that are most in need. It should be a needs test. We believe it should go to the underserved communities, particularly rural areas, minority businesses. But we need to have the data in order to make those decisions. Finally, we must do more to ensure that underserved small businesses have the tools and resources they need to adjust to the long-term economic effects of COVID-19. I was proud to work with Senator Booker to release a plan outlining steps Congress can take to provide greater help for small businesses in underserved communities with regard to startup and operating capital, as well as technical training and mentorship. The aim of our plan is to ensure that when we make it through this pandemic and when we have the next economic downturn, we have institutions, programs, and knowledge to support small businesses, underserved small businesses in a timely way. Mr. Chairman, I'm under no illusions about the tall, tall task ahead of the Senate as we work to finally rid our nation of these inequalities. Before we can begin to make further progress, we must work hard uh, to secure the progress we have already made, uh, which is at risk in regards to COVID-19. Last week at our hearing, Connie Evans of the Association of Enterprise 
opportunity told our committee that the economic consequences of COVID-19 are projected to erase decades of minority enterprise growth in the underserved markets. We cannot let that happen. The Wall Street Journal headline today says, virus obliterates black job market. We need to take action to make sure this does not happen. I look forward uh, to this hearing, learning more from Secretary Mnuchin and Administrator Carranza about what the Trump administration is doing to ensure that minority-owned and other underserved businesses are not left behind during this crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll now turn to our witnesses. Secretary Mnuchin, welcome uh, to the committee, and, uh, and thank you for joining us here today. We check on I think it's, can you try it? I think it might be on. There, it sounds like it's on. Try it now. The, the light, the light is not going on, so I'll, I'll just try to speak. It's here. I think now it's on. Thank you. Chairman Rubio, Ranking Member Cardin, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to highlight the efforts of the Treasury and the SBA to provide relief to businesses and their workers through the Paycheck Protection Program. We are committed to working with you to ensure that every American gets back to work as quickly as possible. America's economy has begun to rebound, and our recovery is underway. While well, estimated predicted nearly 8 million jobs lost in the month of A, the actual data showed 2.5 million jobs gained, the largest one-month jobs gain in record history. Both the jobs that were saved and the jobs that were hired are a large extent as a result of this program, so thank you very much. Several other indicators show that we are well positioned for a strong phased reopening of our economy. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce announced last week that 79 percent of small business are at least partially open, with half the businesses that remain closed planning to reopen very soon. The personal savings rate, released on May 29th, had a record high 33 percent of disposable income, indicating that people have built up cash reserves during the pandemic and will be in a position to resume consumer activity as businesses open. This economic positioning is the direct result of the administration and Congress working together to pass bipartisan legislation to provide necessary liquidity to workers and markets. The PPP has kept tens of millions of employees connected to their jobs. The National Federation of Independent Business found that 73 percent of its members survey rehired or retained workers due to the PPP. Economic impact payments and enhanced unemployment insurance are providing relief to millions of families and workers experiencing distress. The announcement and implementation of the Federal Reserve lending facilities are also enhancing the flow of credit for industries across the economy. We continue to monitor conditions closely as certain industries are rebounding more quickly than others. For example, after losing nearly one million construction jobs in April, nearly half of those jobs have returned in May. By contrast, retail lost over 2 million jobs in April, and 16 percent of those positions returned in May. We remain confident that the overall economy will continue to improve dramatically in the third and fourth quarters of this year. Turning to the PPP, the SBA and Treasury work together to launch this unprecedented program in a very, very short period of time. In less than two months, the PPP is supporting the employment of approximately 50 million workers and more than 75 percent of the small business payroll in all 50 states. This is an extraordinary achievement, and we appreciate the work of this committee. As you might expect, with a program of this magnitude, executed on a national scale in record time, we initially experienced some complications. We resolved them quickly. To implement this program, our teams have worked with members of Congress on a bipartisan basis to issue a series of rules and guidance to provide clarity to the members of the public as well as borrowers and lenders. By standing up the program quickly, we were able to support tens of millions of workers who may have otherwise been laid off or furloughed. Aside from the administration's implementation efforts, we worked closely with members of Congress in both parties to pass two subsequent pieces of critical legislation. We reached an agreement on a second round for over $300 billion, providing business with more time and flexibility to keep their employees on the payroll 
and ensure continued operations as we safely reopen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee for your work in building this program and helping workers and families throughout our nation. I would note that while the PPP is a very important part, it is only one part of the CARES Act, but the single largest economic relief effort in history. Treasury has been hard at work. Economic impact payments, we have distributed nearly 160 million payments worth more than $260 billion in record time. Programs to support aviation and other eligible businesses, we have approved the disbursements of over $27 billion to more than 500 airlines and other businesses, preserving hundreds of thousands of jobs. The Coronavirus Relief Fund, we have dispersed nearly all of the $150 billion appropriated for state, local, and tribal governments. In doing so, we have provided recipients with as much flexibility as possible under the statute. And with the Federal Reserve facilities, we have committed approximately $200 billion in credit support to the Federal Reserve lending facilities under the CARES Act. That money is going to promote the flow of credit to business, households, state and local governments, as well as restore liquidity and funding to credit markets. The Federal Reserve, in consultation with the Treasury, has modified the terms of the lending program since they were announced to ensure broad access to credit and liquidity. We have over $250 billion remaining to create new or expanded programs with the Fed as needed. In conclusion, I am proud of the work we have done with all of you. We will overcome the unprecedented challenges before us together and make sure that every American gets back to work as quickly as possible. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Administrator Cron, thank, uh, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Rubio, Ranking Member Cardin, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on the progress in implementing the CARES Act. The CARES Act created extraordinary programs for the agency. Our work over the last three months has been unprecedented. Let me provide you with some perspective on the historic work that this SBA has been engaged in over the last several months. SBA, in very close coordination with Treasury, stood up the multi-billion dollar paycheck protection program in the matter of days. The dedicated and professional staff at SBA helped to launch the program three days ahead of the 10-day deadline imposed by the CARES Act. In fact, during the first round of funding, SBA processed more than 14 years worth of loans in less than 14 days. In order to help businesses who needed assistance, we also created a simple two-page application for borrowers to streamline the process. Since late March, we issued 16 interim rules and 48 frequently asked question documents while providing your offices with regular reports on daily lending data coupled with detailed program overviews. As of today, the PPP has approved over four and a half million loans for over $511 billion in much needed financial relief to America's small businesses. We administered this program with an eye focused on recognizing that this pandemic had been particularly harmful to socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. In fact, 45% of the PPP loans, both in terms of volume and total value, were dispersed in low income areas. To achieve this, we also reduced administrative roadblocks so that more lenders could participate in the program. The agency signed up 3,600 new lenders, including community banks, credit unions, fintech companies, farm credit lenders, and hundreds of CDFIs and MDIs that specialize in providing liquidity in unprecedented communities and underrepresented communities. As of today, the PPP still has 130 billion in available funds. I ask for your assistance in continuing to raise awareness among your constituents that funds are still available for small businesses that need assistance. In our entrepreneurial development program, the agency worked closely with the resource partner associations as well as committee staff to allocate dollars for 62 SBDCs and 113 women business centers. We also allocated funds and work with the associations on deployment of a website now available for all small businesses to utilize. With our disaster assistance program, the agency worked around the clock to create and implement a new system for idle advances. 
This was a first for the agency, and we have now processed and dispersed monies to all businesses requesting an emergency grant, except for certain businesses that still need to clarify their information. With our idle loans, we have distributed more dollars for COVID than for all disasters combined in the 67-year history of the agency. All of you remember the devastation created in 2017 by Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, three of the costliest storms on record. SBA dispersed over $7 billion. That amount represented 8% of the total COVID-related disaster funding approved by the agency since mid-March. With respect to the debt relief provisions of the Act, SBA issued guidance and conducted outreach to lenders and borrowers. The agency has provided over $2 billion in principal and interest payments on current SBA business loans over the last two months. Before I close, let me briefly discuss how we are improving SBA's operations. Under my leadership, we have managed all the CARES Act programs while also continuing to build an organization. I have created an internal oversight plan for each CARES Act program and to manage the millions of business and disaster loans. The agency has brought on thousands of staff to support our COVID disaster operations while still serving, servicing 175 natural disaster declarations. We have hired a new CFO, CIO, general counsel, and program director for the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. I have also overseen changes within our contracting and investment programs, which many of you raised with me previously. For instance, in March, I changed leadership in the Office of Investment and Innovation, streamlined the licensing process, and licensed our first active SBIC in Puerto Rico in over two decades. We are also on track to fund new licenses for women and minority firms. I have partnered with other federal agencies, among them USDA, CFPB, Treasury, GSA, and FEMA. They have helped inform our immediate economic response efforts and several continue to advise us on the important task of long-term small business economic recovery. And we have done all this while operating on a telework status, as many of you have. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you to both of you. Um, I'm going to defer the balance of my questions so we can get to all the members. I just have one sort of matter I want to clear up. Secretary Mnuchin, in a joint statement you released with the administrator this week, you indicated that borrowers which fail to spend 60% of their loan on payroll costs will continue to be eligible for partial loan forgiveness. Can you confirm that this statement means that borrowers failing to meet the 60% requirement will still receive loan forgiveness equal to their payroll costs and a proportional amount of non-payroll costs? Yes. Thank you. To the ranking member, Senator Cardin. Well, once again, thank you both for your work and for, for being here today. I want to ask my first question on the idle program. And we've talked about this, but I just want to underscore why this is so important to us. And I'm going to give you a specific example of a Maryland small business owner, Nick Johnson, who runs a small furniture company, 28 workers. He applied for a PPP program, uh, loan and got it. He applied for the idle because he needed the funds for working capital and it gave him a 30 year loan program so that he could use it for working capital. He applied for it immediately in March. Two months later, he heard uh, he was eligible to receive $380,000 under the formula, but was capped at $150,000 rather than $380,000. As a result of not being able to get those funds, he had to go into his PPP funds and lay off workers. So we intended for the idle program and the PPP program to work together. And Madam Administrator, I appreciate the fact that you've issued so many idle loans compared to the historic record, but we've never had a universal uh, disaster before. And the volume level, as we understand it, only 15% of the loans were processed and, uh, and that there's still a huge backlog in processing these loans. And we made significantly more capacity available to you through the appropriation process so that you can issue a lot more of these loans 
You put a cap on the program. We don't understand why. You've, you've delayed the applications of those that have already been filed, and you've closed the windows in non-agricultural programs. Why is the EIDL program not being used to its full capacity, and what can we expect in the future moving forward? Senator Cardin, I, I agree with your frustration and uh, your assessment of the delayed process. However, let me start out with the agricultural, um, the small farms and the co-ops. We have since, when it was announced that we were able to accept the ags, over 146,000 um, ag concerns. They have um, several billion, close to $2 billion in loan value. Um, they have also taken advantage of the advance, the grant. Um, the average loan that we're experiencing currently is 68,000. We expected them to really be the community that was going to access the 150,000. We were averaging about, we were anticipating about 83,000 dollars an average loan and they're coming in at sixty three thousand sixty five thousand dollars but what's the rationale for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar cap when the law says statute says up to two million well when we first open up the the portal to accept uh, disaster or idle covid um, applications back in march we went from eighty five thousand loans in one day and in four days the input, the, the demand, um, increased to 3.8 million applications. But as I understand it, with the additional appropriations, you can go up to like $350 billion in idle loans, and I don't think you're anywhere close to a fraction of that today. Yes, but at that time, sir, we had $7 billion available. We exhausted those $7 billion through the subsidy, given the approval. But the same thing was true with PPP. We made money available. The window opened quickly. You processed the new loans quickly. You haven't done that for idle. We made the more funds available, and they have not been processed. I, I understand, sir, but when you look at a idle government loan program, it's, it's exactly that, whereas PPP was designed with um, various distribution channels. So if you go from 1,800 banks in the PPP up to about 5,400 uh, banks, they now have the, the, the small businesses have over 5,000 so, so access let, let, channels, whereas- I understand that. So let, let me just point out, the PPP applications have slowed down. We haven't seen the idols pick up. Uh, this is unacceptable. The idle program has to operate at a much more efficient level. You need to let us know if you need more help. Secretary Mnuchin, I want to ask one question in regards to those who had criminal records. You issued a regulation that prevented them from participating in the PPP program. We've talked about this. There's bipartisan legislation and broad support in the Senate to allow those that have repaid their debt to society to be able to participate in the PPP program, with the exceptions of those that have committed economic fraud type offenses. We, we've been trying to do this administratively. Can we get it done administratively, or are we, do, are we going to have to pass a bill? So th thank you, and first of all, we appreciate all the communication we've had with you on this issue and other issues. We're actually in the process of putting out guidance that I think will come out today, reducing it from five years to three years as a result of your input, and we're happy to work with you and the chairman to see if we should reduce it even more. Well, I appreciate that. I, I did not appreciate it was put in the first place, but uh, I appreciate the fact we've made some progress. I can assure you that we would like you to go probably further than that. We'll have those conversations, and if we have an opportunity, let's work together on legislation so we don't run into this problem in the future. It's bipartisan. Senator Portman, Sangham Langford, and others have all joined in this legislation. The chairman has interest. So let's see whether we can't work that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And I would suggest I'm happy to speak to you and Chairman Rubio tomorrow. And if you want us to shorten it, we'll consider that even more quickly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Senator Rich. Well, Secretary Nuchin, I, I think um, this is a historical moment. The uh, first time we've had the Secretary of Treasury before this committee, I think. Uh, and uh, I think it's a change in leadership. Yeah, I think it's probably the strength of the leadership of the committee that's uh, caused that. But anyway. He was our previous chairman. <laughs> He knows that. <laughs> um, Steve, like, I, when they write the history of this, uh, I, I think you're going to have your own chapter in that history book. Uh, I, I've, you know, I've spent all my life in uh, public service uh, one, one way or another. Uh, 
And, and I got to tell you, when this whole thing hit, this was a tremendous challenge for the United States of America. And uh, my, I always am res reticent uh, to believe that uh, uh, the government can step in and, and fix things uh, easily. Uh, sometimes they make things worse than, uh, than what they are. But I have to tell you, I, I have just been incredibly impressed by your leadership uh, as we've gone through this. I, I do have some inside information because Senator Crapo and I are very, very close personal friends, and I know you and he are on speed dial with each other and, and talk regularly. And I had some issues with it, and I, uh, w with the program like everybody did, and, and I was just absolutely stunned at the way that you stepped up personally uh, to take on these uh, issues and the team that you put around you to take on these issues and your willingness to be flexible uh, as far as making these things work. Um, th this has been a great success. Uh, you, you don't read that in the media or hear it on, uh, on cable news. They're, they're, they're focused on uh, the uh, glitches and they're, when, you, when you're talking about throwing $3 trillion against the wall, there's certainly gonna be uh, glitches. Uh, they're focused on that, but I can tell you as I get out there and talk with the business people in Idaho and, and for that matter around the country, uh, there is tremendous uh, appreciation for what the, what the government has done, particularly appreciation for what the United States Treasury has done administering these programs. And there are millions of businesses and there are tens of millions of people who are a lot better off because of your leadership and the administration's leadership. Uh, in, in taking this uh, taking this thing on uh, head on. So thank you for what you did. I want you to know that notwithstanding a lot of the stuff you read, there is great appreciation amongst the American people. I think history is going to uh, judge you uh, uh, very favorably as we go forward. Uh, I've got just a, a couple of quick questions for you. Number one, are you uh, as surprised as I was as to how the economy is bouncing back. I mean, I, if somebody would have told me 60 days ago that the NASDAQ was gonna set a, a new record uh, uh, in early June, uh, I'd bet the farm against that. Uh, what, what, uh, were you as surprised as a lot of people that, that the economy has, is coming back as quickly as it's coming back, admittedly with some sectors uh, more so than others? What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me just say, first of all, thank you for those kind words. Uh, as I've repeatedly said, this was a unique situation. This was not due to economic issues. This was due to government action and shutting down the economy as the result of COVID-19. So as I've said before, the traditional economic models are, are not good at predicting things. I, I, was, uh, I was somewhat surprised and very pleasantly surprised by the, the recent numbers. I thought that we were going to actually bottom in June and, and not May. But let me just say, as it relates to the markets and the economy and these numbers, this is a direct result of the bipartisan work of the, the Senate and the House in responding in an unprecedented fashion. So not, not only the $3 trillion that we pumped into the economy, but the money that you entrusted to us to work with the Federal Reserve has unlocked markets. And without spending a dime of taxpayer dollars, companies like Boeing, who we thought would have to come to the government for help, were able to raise $25 billion uh, in the markets. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I, I'm just uh, uh, absolutely amazed uh, that the tools that, that really have been developed over the years uh, were used as well as they were used in this regard. And the fact of the matter is that really it was the first test of them. And uh, uh, the fact that they work so well is, uh, is, is just stunning. Um, I've written to you about uh, uh, creating a little bit more simple a process uh, for PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, I hope you've gotten that communication. Uh, seeing how you've looked at everything else, I have no doubt you're, you're going to look at that. We're getting some, some input from the sector that the, the, the process and the application is overly complicated. If you'd have a look at that, uh, I, I would... Uh, I would sincerely appreciate it. Uh, I will. Let me, let me just comment. As a result of the safe harbor that's in the new bill, we'll be writing new guidance and new forms, which will make it substantially easier Thank you. for people we, to we check the safe harbor. Appreciate that. And I have no doubt that uh, I, I, I had no question that you'd probably do that. Let me just say, Administrator Carranza, my, my time is up, but you're getting the same kind of uh, kudos out there from the small business community. 
uh, as far as being able to make the programs work that you've had. So we appreciate that, and uh, I want you to know that uh, appreciation that is there for you too. Uh, the the criticisms that have been made, uh, you guys have stepped up, both of you, and uh, and we uh, America sincerely appreciates it. Accept America's thanks, both of you, for what you've done. Thank you, Senator Ruiz. Thank, and thank I'm you. Very pleased to um, announce that by next week, all of the idle loans will be in the processing in the loan portal. So all of the five million applications that we have that actually represent over seven million employees and obviously five million small businesses will actually be in the uh, loan portal. There's two sections to that portal. One is the application, the other one is the loan processing, which means within a week's time that uh, those loans will be uh, processed and we will be over with the idols. So well, I, again, I'm really I, encouraged by that. In closing, just let me say that uh, again, uh, the, the media has really focused on some glitches, but the big story here, and it is a big story, uh, is how successful all this has been. And you're to be commended for it. Uh, you won't get the credit that you deserve for it, at least now, maybe you will in the history books. Uh, but again, thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me add my thanks to um, you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Cardin for your bipartisan effort and to those who are also participating, Senator Shaheen and Collins, for all the work that's gone in to the small business agenda. It is really historic to show this bipartisan level, and frankly, we need it. We're not, we're not through this, and we need it to come through again. Um, access to capital is a persistent issue for small business. And one of the great things I was proud that uh, our side focused on was the CDFI issue. I can see in my state where the CDFIs are basically getting out and getting, uh, marketing themselves and getting access to capital to frankly small businesses who just got turned down by banks. So I know you can't guarantee how banks operate, but um, obviously this has been a problem and we need to figure out solutions. Um, People with good banking relations got turned down, and people without good banking relations probably never had a chance. So the CDFI process has been working, and we should figure out how to continue it. The issue that comes before us now today is that um, there are a lot of women and minority-owned businesses, always also a pervasive problem with access to capital, and this committee has done good work with that in the past, prioritizing smaller loan grants and a whole variety of things to get capital. But I do think that we should be looking at what my colleagues, Senator Cardin and Shaheen, are recommending that we prioritize smaller size small businesses. I particularly think 10 and under uh, that make sure that we're getting access to capital. There are a lot of women and minorities that are small businesses under, uh, you know, 10 employees. And again, how do they how do they keep that business going if they don't have access to capital? So I hope in this next round we'll prioritize that, and I hope both of you will agree on that. Um, I can say because I worked a lot on various aspects of other parts of the bill in addition to the small business that I saw Secretary Mnuchin many hours day and night working around the clock on these provisions so I thank him for that. Um, I want to ask uh, you, so if you, do you both agree that we should pr prioritize, figure out some way to make sure we're sending a message that we want small businesses prioritized under 10 people? Yes, absolutely. There, there's a focus at SBA and apologize for jumping in, but um, there's a focus at SBA with sole proprietors and independent contractors because they are really not ones that are going to aggressively uh, pursue loans, and so we have a task force at SBA dedicated to that, those particular um, communities, as well as um, dedicated resources to look at how we can um, uh, optimize the CDFI community. We, we've, we've done really well, up to 400, 430 plus, yep. but we can do more. Thank you. I, I, I have two questions, though, for you, Sec um, Mr. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Mnuchin, and that is, uh, when we were doing the aviation part of the bill, we definitely thought that the aviation supply chain was critical to America's security. We thought of that as the aviation commercial supply chain not just the defense supply chain. So we've had a couple of hearings in commerce, and we want the dollars to go out the door to someone who is in the supply chain who is making commercial manufacturing parts for the supply chain. We think that those dollars should be eligible to them. Do you agree? 
I'm more than happy to follow up with you and, and talk to you about that. Uh, many of the aviation supply chain is getting advances we've been monitoring, but to the extent there's specifics, I'm happy to address them with you. Well, the 17 billion that was there, we, we believe the definition of important to national security is commercial. You didn't have to be engaged in a defense contract that keeping the commercial supply chain is critical to our national security because if we don't have a, a aviation sector, it's going to impact us. So definitely want those dollars out the door and there seems to be a problem. Another area that there are problems with is $8 billion for our tribal governments and as somebody who represents 29 different uh, entities in the in the Northwest definitely want to see those dollars out the door. Can you tell me when the $8 billion for tribal governments will be distributed? Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the second tranche of that money is going to go out tomorrow, uh, and that the only thing that is going to be held back at that point is the litigation issue associated with Alaska. Okay, on the tribal issue, you're saying? Yes. Okay, Yeah, but the, the money, the first tranche went out, the second tranche is literally going out tomorrow. Well, thank you. Or and actually, maybe Friday, I apologize. It's either tomorrow or Friday, but it okay. is going on. Well, I'm definitely tomorrow. going to follow up with aerospace. And again, everybody, let's keep working in a bipartisan basis, but let's not forget those that are getting left behind. It's complex. It's always been a problem. Getting access to capital for those who are small is always hard. Thank you. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the panel for being with us uh, this morning. Certainly appreciate both of your uh, Y'all's commitment to making sure that we have the resources available to really help small businesses survive an economic crisis that they've never seen in their lifetimes. Every single small business owner that I spoke to around the country had the exact same words that without the Paycheck Protection Program, they would not have survived. So survival was the key and the focus. But now the focus turns from survival to recovery. And so as we think about recovery, my question is, as June 30th comes uh, sooner than some would like, uh, many are asking about a second bite of that apple. Is there is there an opportunity as you all think through where we should go? Is there, uh, access, is there an appetite for folks to perhaps see another four weeks of the PPP in, in addition to what they already have? And, and or are there any other ideas that are on the table that speaks to the recovery aspect of where we are and not simply the survival mode that we have been in to either panel. Well, Senator Scott, th thank you and appreciate uh, all of your help. I definitely think we are going to need another bipartisan uh, legislation to put more money into the economy. I think as we've said, we don't wanna rush into that because we wanna be both careful at this point in seeing how the money is, is in the economy. A lot of the money is still not in it. And two, I think we need to be much more targeted at this point. So I think at the point when we were in an emergency, we had to put a lot of money in the economy and we knew that it would not be perfection. But I think whatever we do going forward needs to be much more targeted, particularly to the industries and small businesses that are having the most difficulty in, in reopening as a, ro a result of COVID-19. And we're, we look forward to working with you and the rest of the committee uh, over the next few weeks as we think about that. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, as we rolled out the program, one of the perhaps one of the more exciting aspects of the rollout included taking the 7A program from a few 800 lenders to I think over 5,000 ultimately were engaged in the process, which was phenomenal from my perspective. The fintech world also provided a lot of traction to smaller businesses that may not have had that relationship. Uh, I certainly think that we have, are emerging into a, a new part of the process where fintech and unorthodox uh, folks should be a part of that process going forward. What's been, what was your experience and how should we anticipate the use of fintech as a part of the next wave of opportunities? Thank you for your question, Senator, because this allows me an opportunity to share with the committee that we had dedicated resources to work with the fintech uh, companies that approached us and indicated that they could provide microloans 
to thousands of uh, people in the underserved markets. And so that seemed like a real appeal for us and a way to really penetrate that community, the, the underserved community. So um, I won't mention their names, but we had four um, FinTech companies. We had two dedicated resources, one uh, from Treasury and the other from CFPB to be focused in on working with Treasury to get them um, licensed or authorized to be a preferred uh, lender for us. So it really worked well, and they're still in play. Excellent. My final question to either, uh, as uh, Senator Cantwell discussed CDFIs, uh, that was not one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. That was frankly just common sense from both sides of the aisle, but perhaps America needs to see a little bit more common sense from both sides of the aisle. Without any question, uh, Secretary, you and I had many conversations or, that I recall on MDFIs as well as CDFIs and MSIs. And I hope that as we look into the future with the new FinTech platform, looking for ways to serve uh, minority communities that have had a challenging time of having access to capital, that that will be a part of our forward looking and the ability to help fund some of the MSIs to market as we did through the, uh, the, the Minority Business Development Agency to provide resources for the marketing of these resources in minority communities also proved to be helpful as well. So just more of a comment than a question. I comment on, uh, you know, the technology and working with the CDFIs is, is very important. I want to give a shout out to Robert Smith, who spent a lot of time with us and has dedicated technology without making any fees to those CDFIs so that they can outreach more people, but he, he and his company have been very accessible, and I think we've done a good job, and we need to do a much better job going forward. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any final thoughts, Administrator? I was just going to comment on Robert Smith, but you beat me to it. Um, so we're collectively uh, working with, with that entity. Well, Robert has a very busy phone because he keeps calling, because he has good ideas, and they actually work. So thank you all for being receptive to the private sector being engaged in this process. I think it was one of the bright spots of the relief package without question. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cardin. And thank you both for being here this morning. I, I certainly applaud, as all of us do, the important difference that the small business programs made, the PPP programs and the EIDL programs have made for businesses in New Hampshire. We've had 22,000 businesses that have received over two and a half billion dollars. Um, Senator Cardin, though, very eloquently expressed my frustration at not being able to get information as we were looking at changes that we need to make to the program so that we could ensure that what was working continued and what wasn't working could be changed. And so uh, I, it's like closing the barn door after the horses gotten loose, but I, I think all of us would like to feel like we're getting regular information so that as we're trying to perform not just our oversight mission, but to look at what we need to do to make changes, that we have that data in front of us. And so I hope that that will be more forthcoming in the future than it has been in the past. Um, I want to follow up on Senator Scott's question about a second round of help, because we're hearing, I'm our office is hearing from a lot of small businesses in New Hampshire who got the original PPP loans who are about to run out of money this week or next week. They did everything that was prescribed in the program. You know, they hired back their people. They, um, you know, have been waiting to start up their businesses, many in the hospitality and tourism industry, which are the last to open up. And in New Hampshire, that's a significant part of our economy. And now they're about to run out of money, about to be in the position of having to lay off those employees again, and are worried about whether they're going to go under in the next couple of weeks. So I've been, Senator Cardin talked about the legislation that he and Chris Coons and I have been working on to try and look at a second round. When we've got $140 billion still remaining in the PPP program, I would hope that we could all agree that this is an opportunity that we should take advantage of for those businesses that need continued help. I know the the jobs numbers were better than expected last week, but 13% unemployment is still not acceptable. And we don't want another whole round of layoffs because we have small businesses who got help 
and now can't get additional help when they need it. So I hope you will both be open to that. I don't know if you have a view. You talked, Secretary Mnuchin, about needing some more time to look at that, but for some of these small businesses, they don't have extra time. Well, again, let me just emphasize, we are 100% committed to making sure that people that have lost their jobs get back to work, and people that have their jobs can keep their jobs. Uh, that's a absolute priority of ours. As you've said, the unemployment rate is still way too high, no fault of their own. And there's no question that small businesses in many industries are going to need more help. So we look forward to working with the committee and the rest of the Senate on a bipartisan basis to include incentives. And wh whether it's through the PPP or others or tax credits, we're open-minded, but we absolutely believe small business, and by the way, many big businesses sure, absolutely. in certain industries are absolutely going to need more help. Thank you. Administrator Carranza, you talked about the effort to move the idle loans through the program, and I think that's probably the program that we've heard the most frustration from businesses in New Hampshire about, and we are still hearing from them on a daily basis that they can't get information about the status of their idle loans. So you talked about expecting all of the ones that are in the queue to be approved by next week or to be acted on by next week. What can we tell those businesses that are calling our office about how to get information because they're not able to get through on the um, toll-free line in the SBA to get answers to their questions? Senators, I will um, emphasize the amount of resources that we have added at the phone center. There's 3,000 versus uh, the few hundred that we had a, a couple of months ago, and then we've added um, approximately another thousand when we talk about the paralegals and whatnot to reconcile mm -hmm. some of the loans. With regards to, and, and I'll, I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit to explain Good. why Please. the visibility of a loan is not realized with this new automated system. What we understand on the traditional legacy system, it had a lot of visibility. That's the system that would uh, manage all of the natural disaster loans. When we had to ramp up and do a surge processing input and throughput, what was not what was not built was a um, what we call a loan tracking visibility, and that's why it has limited visibility. We can we we have visibility on the intake, and then when it, they get notified by email that their loan is progressing, and now it's a matter of they make a decision whether they want to pursue the loan and whatnot. So there is this gap that there is no visibility. We, we did not have, because of time, because of the, the urgency to just get that machinery go, um, up and running, we did not allow the engineer to build that, that piece. And so now it requires uh, particular loan officers to view that. We are uh, in the process of fixing that because we are now being prepared to accept more um, applications uh, besides the ag. And we, we have a few hundred thousand waiting in the queue to, to and, and we'd like to take them on. We've learned a lot. Um, the amount of communication that's necessary, the, the, the amount of person face to face contact, not just emails, because we have um, made available up to nine contacts within the time frame that we're speaking to about a loan status. Um, we have about 65,000 that want to re enter and be reconsidered for more funds and we're working through that as well. So there's uh, about two or three um, portfolios we're working through to make sure that we provide a lifeline. It may not be the $2 million, but what we can um, provide is a lifeline to many more at that particular cap. And so um, we're, we're looking to activate that. When I, when I made reference to applications being all in the queue by next week, all of the 5.4 million applications that we've had since March to, 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 to this date are now going to be um, uh, in that loan portal, which they're making an assessment on. And the reason we're able to do that is that we went from a production where a loan officer processed about three to five loans a day to now 50 loans a day. Um, and so because of that surge, we're realizing more efficiency and I, um, 
I look forward to resolving those issues very quickly. And I do look forward to communicating with you now more often. We, we did have conference calls with, with the committee mm -hmm. and members, yeah, um, such as uh, the chairman and, and the ranking member, Senator Cardin. It wasn't frequent enough, but I pulled away from the operations and I'll be able to, to personally meet with everyone and update you much more frequently. Well, thank you. I, I think that's very important and I'm out of time, but, but the more transparent we can be, the more people understand what's going on with the program, the less frustration and the more understanding we will have. So um, thank you both. And I, I hope we can continue to have a bipartisan approach to helping the small businesses in this country. Thank you. Senator uh, Kennedy. Senator Kennedy, yes, sir. Unless you have nothing to say, which I doubt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary and Madam Administrator. I've had some oral surgery, as you can probably tell, so my speech is, is uh, my accent's the same, but my speech is a little impaired. That's a blessing or a curse. Mr. Secretary, do you have uh, economists on your staff that can uh, put a value on the amount of damage that was done to businesses from the looting and the burning from the rioting, not from not the economic impact of the the peaceful protests, uh, protests in America or as American as baseball, but felony looting is not. Do, do you have economists that can put an impact, a, a value on the economic impact to those small and larger businesses? Uh, I do have economists. I will ask them whether they have data that they can look at to do that and get back to you. I don't know the answer. Okay. Why, why we, we have about, what, $130 billion we haven't dispersed through the PPP program. Is that correct? That is. So it would appear we're going to have some money left over. Is that correct? It is. I'm going to introduce a bill that I would like you and your uh, very able, and I mean that sincerely, colleagues at Treasury to look at, to, uh, to take some of that money and make it available to the, uh, to the businesses, mostly small businesses, but to the businesses that uh, um, have, been, have been lost as a result of the burning and the looting and the felony rioting. I think they're going to need help. We're, we're more than happy to look at that with you. And let me just comment on the- Pull that mic closer for me. I, I said, uh, we're, we're more than happy to follow up with you on that. And let me just comment on the extra money. As you recall, Congress gave us an extra $60 billion more than we needed. And because everybody was so skeptical that we were gonna run out. So some component of this extra money we did not anticipate we'd be able to put to work, but we look forward to working with you on potentially repurposing it. Well, I'm going to introduce that bill. We're drafting it now. And uh, if we do have an additional um, coronavirus bill, uh, I would like to consider, uh, I'd like you to consider making that a part of it. We'll absolutely work with you, Mr. Sam. Um, and I would like, if you could put some of your best minds, you and the administrator, uh, to quantifying the damage done from the rioting. Uh -oh. Now, I would envision that we, we have arrested a lot of people, our law enforcement authorities, uh, who, who, uh, who caused this, who did the burning and looting. And I would, I, we're probably going to put a, a provision or a bill where, where the authorities have to go after them for civil liability, basically take their assets and offset the money that taxpayers would have to spend. Uh, but I would like you to take a look at that. We will. Thank you. And talk to the president about it. No, number two, um, I, I want to cut to the chase here. If you were king for a day, what would you put in the next coronavirus bill other than the idea I just articulated to you? 
Uh, if I were king for a day, I'd say we should spend the next 30 days looking at a lot of different things that will be in that bill. My yes, sir, but you're, I know you've been thinking about them. My, my and I'd like to get your general thoughts now of what we should be thinking about. No, I, I think that, one, we're going to need money for business to encourage businesses to rehire people, especially in areas that have been most impacted. So whether it's the travel, leisure, restaurants, uh, you can't get hotel capacity back up to speed without hiring people first. So what else? That is an example. I think we're going to need to fix unemployment. So we knew there was issues with the enhanced unemployment, where in certain cases we were paying people more not to work than work. I think we've seen from the recent numbers that didn't have a big impact because people want their jobs. But we will have a significant amount of unemployment, and we're going to need to look at doing something there. Uh, I think we're going to seriously look at whether we want to do more direct money to stimulate the economy. But I think this is all, all going to be about getting people back to work. Uh, and we look forward to working with the entire Senate on this. Um, what, what about, uh, and, I, and I'm going to try to be quick here, um, what about uh, incenting investors to invest in the economy? Uh, capital gains treatment that would be relaxed, that sort of thing? Uh, it's, it's something we've discussed. Uh, my opinion right now is that the, the Fed facilities have unlocked the capital markets. There's a lot of liquidity for investment. That's something we'll look at, but I think we're much more targeted at getting people back to work. And I think investors are prepared to invest a lot of liquidity that they have right well, now. Well, the Federal Reserve has done a great job. And yes, they have unlocked the credit markets, unlocked them, but at great expense. We, we can talk another day about the size of the balance sheet now at the Federal Reserve. But uh, I, look, I think Jay Powell's a rock star. I think he did great. Final thought, a lot of the banks and the small business women and small business men uh, think that the uh, federal government is going to double cross them on the forgiveness of these loans. You need to be mindful of that. Um, you also need, you and the administrator need to take some of those smart minds in your office, and you have plenty of them, and try to reduce that 11 page form to about half. And you both need, in my opinion, uh, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but but articulate to the business people out there that the federal government is not looking for ways to, uh, to, to, to uh, catch the banks or the businesses who took this money in a minor mistake so the loans can, can be turned into loans. I, I assure you that's the case. And let me just emphasize, in the recent bill, there is an extension from two years to five to ten years. But I don't expect businesses are going to need to use that because I think the majority of this money is going to be forgiven in the next few months, and, and that's our intent. And I would just and highlight. And I know that, Mr. Secretary, but they don't trust us, I, I and for good reason. And that's why we're going to get the job done quickly. And there's also, let me just give a little pitch. There's a third-party calculator that you can put all in the information and you can get the forgiveness forms done in 15 minutes. And as I said, with the new, uh, the new uh, legislation, with the safe harbor, it's going to be even easier. So trust me, I, I've had people ask us about the form EZ, Senator Collins and others. You know, I'd like to make this as easy as possible. We do have a law that we're required to work within. But I, I want to assure people that have taken this money, our intent is to get this stuff processed quickly. And I should have also mentioned, uh, you know, we've been speaking with you and others, obviously, on the state issue, and I know you have le potential legislation, so I should have also put that on the list, obviously, that we'll address on a bipartisan basis. Think about helping the business people who were hurt, hurt from the looting and the burning. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Senator Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cardin, uh, and thank you, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, Administrator Carranza. Um, as many of my colleagues uh, have remarked, um, this is a rare bright spot of bipartisanship um, and of partnership um, that has delivered a lot of relief to millions of businesses and lots of households and families. There are some aspects of our work together 
um, that haven't been realized as quickly as many of us had hoped. The idle loans have ended up being a challenge to deliver. There's others where there's more work to be done together uh, to make the forgiveness process uh, swift and uh, clear and appropriate. Uh, I want to focus for a few minutes on uh, a piece of the CARES Act, the Small Business Debt Relief Act, that maybe has not gotten the visibility it needs uh, and where we could, I think, make some more progress. Uh, before COVID-19, uh, African-American business owners uh, were typically denied bank loans at triple the rate of non-minority uh, business owners. Um, and some of the pressures of this recession are compounding pre-existing inequalities. And that's exactly one of the core reasons um, I worked and many colleagues worked to get uh, the Debt Relief Act into CARES Title I. Uh, it gives six months of principal interest and free relief uh, for 7A, 504, and micro lending programs, programs that by definition existed in order to help uh, those who were denied loans elsewhere. Um, just a quick example, uh, Orange Theory Fitness in Pike Creek, Delaware, uh, right near where I grew up, is a black-owned business that is now saving $9,000 a month because of this automatic uh, debt relief program. Uh, I spoke to its owner, Yvonne Gordon, last week, who's been working tirelessly to reopen her small business and to um, go back to serving customers. Um, but I'm concerned um, that there aren't enough small businesses that are required, not just eligible, but required by law to receive this benefit. There are some remaining who haven't. So Administrator Carranza, if you would, has the SBA identified uh, all the businesses eligible to receive this automatic relief uh, and who their lenders are? Um, and what are you doing to make sure that every single covered borrower is fully participating uh, in this automatic relief program of six months. We've seen an uptick. Uh, it started out with about a billion and a half, and now it's up to two, two billion um, that that have recognized the principal and the interest and and um, coverage. And so, uh, an email was sent out. We spoke to uh, the the uh, banks, but we have to do a better job of that. Um, an, another level of outreach. We saw the increase in. We um, need to do a better job of not only tracking the businesses, but also making sure we work with the lenders. It's supposed to be an automatic yep. transaction, and, and it has occurred for many, but I believe um, uh, knowledge is power, and we'll have to do a better job in that area, sir. So. Thank you, Administrator. We, we, I, I do think we're still falling short in reaching every business. The businesses I've heard from in Delaware that have benefited from this, it's made a critical uh, and timely uh, difference. Um, there's also a question that Senator Duckworth uh, wanted me to ask. She's at an Armed Services Committee hearing. We've both worked on, it is a small technical issue. It was a drafting error, I'm convinced, in the CARES Act. Uh, but the cap for 7A and PPP are tied. Uh, we passed on a bipartisan basis here in the Senate a technical fix. It's been held up uh, in the House. Just if you would speak briefly to how important is it to avoid a shutdown of the 7A loan program because of this um, drafting error? We don't see an exposure on the 7A um, shutting down. We actually have available funds for that particular program. So I, I need to get back to you on that. I, I've not heard of any such position at this point. We're actually doing really well in our 504 and our community advantage. We're looking to um, um, develop another loan option for our underserved communities. So. I, I look forward to getting back I'm, to you on that. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Please. I know it's a minor issue, but it's been flagged by staff on both sides of the aisle, and I think we can work through it. Um, three more quick questions, if I can. The CARES Act gave $200 million to the GAO for oversight. Um, the ranking member, Senator Cardin, referenced this. Um, the SBA makes data on individual loans available on its website for the 7A loan program. Um, and the administration says it plans to do so for PPP loans at a future date. Uh, why haven't you made individual loan PPP data available? Um, and can you assure us that the GAO is going to get the access to the data they need to do their job uh, of oversight within the executive branch? I, I, I can comment on that. So Thank you, Secretary. Uh, in, uh, First of all, let me just say we absolutely believe in transparency, and we were very clear across the programs on agreeing to significant transparency, especially in, in the Fed facilities, which weren't required. As it relates to the names and amounts 
of specific PPP loans, we believe that that's proprietary information. And in many cases, for sole proprietors and small businesses, is, is confidential information. So the reason why we're not disclosing the names in individual amounts, unlike in the 7A program, is because of that issue. But we are working with the GAO from an oversight uh, to make sure that they're comfortable and they do have access to information. Thank you, Secretary. I do think it's critical that GAO have access to all the data they need to do their job. And a, a quick question for you, Mr. Secretary, to follow up on something Senator Kennedy referenced. As retail and um, hospitality are reopening, um, their supply chains, which often rely on credit, um, are finding, you know, three months later, there's a lot of concern about the, the cost. There's much more liquidity. But credit insurance and factors um, are becoming a key blockage. I've heard from a number of restaurateurs and folks in retail that rely on credit to finance restarting, that they're really having difficulty. I hope you're looking at credit insurance and sort of the backstop end of the credit side of those supply chains. Yes, and I'm happy to follow up with you, you and your office on that. Thank you. Your engagement's been terrific. If I could ask just one last question. Um, it's been referenced by the clock. I am I'm a minute and 45 over. And in 15 seconds, I'll simply say um, I hope for a positive response on a bill referenced by Senators Cardin and Shaheen that we're introducing for a prioritized paycheck protection program for a genuinely small business that has suffered significant revenue loss. It would give them a chance for another PPP loan if they've responsibly completed one, given that we have $140 billion in unused funds. Thank you for your forbearance. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, subscribe to the comments that uh, uh, Jim Risch indicated uh, about uh, support across our country for the help that uh, your respective agencies have provided for our economy and for the people uh, who work in our economy. I also recognize there have been a few, more than a few glitches and concerns and, and, and uh, uh, errors uh, that have occurred, but I'm, I'm thinking about the banana stand on Arrested Development. If they went from two customers to 2,000 customers, it would make it kind of difficult for the guy dipping the bananas in the chocolate sauce and the peanuts and so forth. And you have had to staff up very quickly, and I think uh, what you have done is, has been to rescue many, many uh, jobs for our, for our uh, country, and I appreciate th that very much. What I hear as I talk to people uh, in our small business community is uh, how much they appreciate these loans, but also they're beginning to be concerned about whether or not they're going to be qualified for forgiveness. And they, they note that in some cases they tried to rehire employees. Uh, they found it hard to do so. Uh, in some cases, people are making more by not working than they were by working, so they're not able to get them back, or others have moved elsewhere uh, to get employment or opportunity elsewhere with family. Uh, I hope, and, and, and underscoring uh, what uh, Senator Kennedy said, that as you look at ways to determine that people qualify for forgiveness, that we're not sticklers, that we instead are looking to help people uh, get a forgive get forgiveness as opposed to uh, exacting um, uh, penalties on them. That being said, uh, in terms of loan forgiveness, uh, uh, I'm concerned about circumstances where businesses applied for a loan, received money, but actually saw no reduction in revenues at all and remained fully profitable. And I hear about those circumstances. I see them written about in various journals and, and believe that given the fact that in the loan application, you noted, quote, that this loan is necessary to support ongoing operations, that, uh, that if a business did not see a reduction in revenue, that it should not qualify for forgiveness, that it should be uh, maintained as a, as a loan. Um, uh, is that something which you think guidance can be provided on or do you, are you subscribe to that thought? So, uh, Senator Romney, thank you. And, uh, you know, I personally had the opportunity to talk to you about these issues and many others. And I, I know that the revenue test was something that the committee actually considered when this was written at the time. And I think the, the general idea we had was so many people were going to be impacted by this that uh, not to include the revenue test. Now, as, as I've said publicly, um, when we put in that certification, we thought that people would self-select appropriately. And unfortunately, there were a number of companies that were high profile that took the loans, and I publicly came out against that. 
We did get about $12 billion returned, I think, to a large extent. It was from large public companies and some large sporting teams that I'm a big fan of. Uh, I, I, you know, we uh, and, and I had uh, many discussions with many people on this committee on a bipartisan basis about this test on the certification. We made a judgment that the majority of the small businesses, 98 percent by number, were under two million and most likely legitimately took it. So we issued a safe harbor. And on 2% of the, the, the loans that are the larger loans, we will do a review. Some of that will be an automated review. And we hope to have the proper balance uh, on that. Uh, away from that, there will be a more general audit just to make sure that people, there's not fraud in, in, in other things. But uh, I, I look forward to speaking to you and others uh, on this issue. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, you noted in your opening comments that uh, we expect a strong phased recovery in the third and fourth quarter, uh, that there has been uh, substantial cash, cash resources of our consumers, uh, and that, um, uh, that we expect a, a dramatic improvement in quarter three and qu quarter four. So I'm puzzled by the uh, statement that you make that we're going to need a stimulus. Uh, to get the economy going again. I understand very much that there are going to be certain sectors of the economy, uh, hospitality and so forth, that will need ongoing help, but there may be small businesses uh, that, that will need help, and therefore we may want to extend the PPP program beyond uh, uh, the, the end of the month. Uh, but uh, do you believe that we're going to need a stimulus, or is the economy uh, poised to come back uh, Again, with uh, with those uh, uh, those outliers, is the economy poised to come back without further stimulus? Well, I, I said it's one of the things we want to consider, and the reason not to jump into CARES four is uh, uh, hopefully we won't need a CARES five and a CARES six. Um, I do think the economy is going to rebound significantly, but I'd also say there is still significant damage in parts of the economy. And we're going to consider using all of our fiscal tools, working with Congress to make sure that we restore this economy back to where it was and where it should be, and to make sure that the many Americans that still don't have jobs get back their jobs. So we look forward to your business experience and working with you and others to make sure we do this appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And before I turn it over to Senator Booker, I just want to comment on the revenue thing. We, we did talk about it quite a bit, and Senator Cardin, Collins, and Shaheen will recall. We had two concerns about it. The first on the front end is that it would create all this paperwork, right? The small business would have to accumulate all of this paperwork to show what the revenue was so they can compare it down the system. I was concerned it would slow down that process because I am, I know at first blush, especially we were all very, I am very sympathetic to this argument that if you're making a bunch of money, why do you need this loan? The other thing we were concerned about is what does a business that survive, do, do? And that is sometimes they get creative and they reinvent themselves in a crisis. So for example, maybe you made clothes, but now you're making masks and PPP allowed them not just to keep people employed, but reinvent themselves and provide a, a need. And we didn't want to discourage or punish people from doing it. It's a complicated issue. I think it's one we should continue to talk about. We certainly don't want people taking advantage of it. But those were some of the things we were worried about when we were talking about all this at, at the front end. Um, Senator Booker. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just first want to just, um, just echo a lot of the comments that have been made by people on both sides of the aisle about the work not just the two of you have done in this really difficult time in American history, but frankly, your teams, the civil servants that work under you, uh, your agencies have been able to do things that we couldn't even imagine just uh, at the end of last year. So I just want to give my, uh, my gratitude for the difference it's made in my state. Uh, uh, it's just been extraordinary, and there's a lot of folks uh, that are happy. And I just want to echo um, also uh, it's the pride I have in working in such a bipartisan way. We've seen uh, people on both sides of the aisle on this committee come together and just do really good work. I think in Senator Rubio's opening comments, he talked about the fact that so many of us rose to the occasion, put aside politics, and really focused on people and businesses. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, I come at this next issue in a very personal way, but also a very bipartisan way. Um, a lot of it's my own faith in Matthew 25, just being concerned with people who are often marginalized. Uh, 87 of us senators voted. Uh, uh, to think that the, a lot of the sentences we give to people are just too dag nab long. 
and we are in a bipartisan way doing a lot on criminal justice reform. I worked with the administration, talked to Jared, uh, my fair chance bill passed about people coming out of prison and eliminating that box that they often have to check. And so I'm still perplexed, though I'm grateful that you, uh, Secretary Munchen, uh, offered to revisit this issue. Um, and I'm grateful, again, in a bipartisan way, Senators Portman, Cardin, Lankford, and others put together limit, uh, legislation to eliminate uh, the restrictions that are preventing people uh, from getting access to these loans. Incredible entrepreneurs in cities and communities all across America who are now denied the aid or seeing their, their small businesses collapse, which are often critical pillars in many, many, uh, many communities. And this uh, uh, bipartisan issue, it's been endorsed and supported from everybody from the ACLU to the American Conservative Union. And so, and Freedom Works, and and so I just, again, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, want to know: uh, Do you believe that an individual who has uh, started a business is contributing to their local economy, is creating jobs, who has prior unrelated convictions, should really be barred from participating in the PPP program? Well, first, let me say we, we want to work with you and others to fix this and fix this really quickly. As I said, the original. Uh, 7A program had seven years. We reduced it to five years. We thought we'd reduce it. Uh, we're, we're happy if there's bipartisan support. We're happy to make the change this week and reduce it even more. So, again, I know there was – we obviously have some issues about people who were convicted for financial crimes and other things. Well, you, can, you, can, you and I both know that's an easy thing to eliminate, yeah, the financial so it, crimes. It, it, again, th this is uh, – we're, we're happy to be responsive on this. I'm grateful. I have limited time. So I will just say that uh, this is not a small issue. This is thousands of people affecting tens of thousands of jobs. This just basic ideal of, of justice, it seems incredible. And to that extent, I'd like to put something else on your radar screen, uh, something called pretrial diversion. Uh, uh, we know what pretrial diversion is, but for, for those who may not, um, these are specifically designed programs to allow individuals to plead guilty and subject to completion of, of certain uh, court-mandated programming, their guilty plea is vacated. And they do not have that mark of a criminal record, which has 40,000 collateral consequences if you have a criminal conviction. It's a good program. And it only happens when the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense attorney, all components of our criminal justice system agree, they come together and agree that the individual should not have to suffer those collateral consequences associated with a criminal conviction. So despite the consensus of the entire criminal justice community, um, uh, we are doing the contrary. We're denying people that are in these pretrial diversion programs who are entrepreneurs, contributing to our economy, employing other Americans, we're denying them what Prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys all agree should not be a bar, should not be a bar on collateral consequences. What's that? This is being denied. The, the PPP program is being denied to those folks. And this should shock the conscience of a yeah, court. Let me just say, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but I'll work with the administrator. And if that's the case, we'll make that fix immediately. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. Thank God. Pass the collection plate. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Uh, that commitment uh, is noted, uh, and, I, and I'm really grateful. I, I want to be respectful of the time in 10 seconds. I just want to echo uh, what a lot of my colleagues have already said about uh, still not an equitable distribution of the funds. A lot of uh, minorities are, are, are falling out of this program, uh, uh, and a lot of it's just because small businesses, the, the smallest sort of, as we call them, mom-and-pop shops or not. Uh, Senator Daines and I have mentioned it to you before. Uh, have a bill to help those um, those funds that are started up. New Jersey has one through our Economic Development Authority. They're in all across our country to seed them with resources to help because they're better targeted towards those smaller mom and pop shops. It'll address issues of equity and getting a lot of funds out the door. I just, again, make that appeal to my colleagues on, on this uh, to look at our bipartisan effort to do this. And, I, and again, I, I respect and appreciate uh, your willingness to help this. But thank you very much uh, for uh, the comments you just made about people in pretrial diversion, it it's, uh, makes me extraordinarily happy. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you for raising that issue. And in fairness, uh, the, sec the Secretary has told us in, in numerous conversations that um, if we could come up with bipartisan language that we support, he'd be more than happy to facilitate it on the criminal justice issue. I think we're fairly close on that, but I think time is of the essence given the June 30th 
date that, that awaits on the cutoff of the program. Yeah, and, and I'll reiterate that uh, on behalf of the administrator and I. If we get a letter from the, the chair and the ranking member, we will institute the changes. So that we had said that on the call. So uh, again, we'll make your change immediately. But in regards to other changes on this issue, we're happy to implement them as soon as we get guidance from both of you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like to associate myself as well with the concerns of Senator Booker. Uh, in Iowa, of course, uh, we are very short in our in our labor pool, and we truly value those that have served their their time, their uh, commitment. Uh, to the great state of Iowa and those that want to find a positive path forward through entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and starting small businesses. So um, certainly I think that a, a number of us would want to engage in those activities to make sure that we're extending opportunity for everyone that, that does deserve that opportunity. Um, but, but thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, very much for being here. And we are seeing some strong numbers coming forward, and I am thrilled. And I think because of the work that has been done through the Small Business Administration, through the Treasury, through especially the Paycheck Protection Program, we have been able to save, preserve a number of small businesses and jobs across the United States. And that has been reflected in, uh, in the numbers that we are seeing. Uh, in May, it was projected that we would lose 8 million jobs, and instead we were able to add back 2.5 million. And again, I credit so much the, the program that you have put into place that we have enacted and uh, playing a key role for a really stunning turnaround in the economy. So thank you for that. Um, I do appreciate your hard work in implementing the program. There's still a lot of work to do, things that have been identified just as Senator Booker did, but we are definitely heading in the right direction. I do have a question, um, uh, Administrator. Uh, last month, we found out that Planned Parenthood affiliates received $80 million through PPP, despite the fact that SBA's affiliation rules disqualify them. Um, what actions are being taken to ensure that Planned Parenthood returns those funds and is held accountable for the violation of SBA rules? Well, SBA takes the affiliation rules very close. We look at it very closely and uh, very fairly. And at this point, um, I'll just say that all affiliations are being looked at. And uh, I'm not in a position to speak about any one particular um, bar at this point. But they will be they will be reviewed, not just Planned Parenthood, but all of yes. the other affiliations that have uh, unfairly taken advantage take of SBA. Yes, necessary course of action. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then as well um, for the secretary, uh, forgiveness, of course, has become a large issue now that we are are moving into a state of recovery. Uh, the PPP forgiveness application, it's very complicated, and I hear that from Iowans time and time again, where uh, the application process was fairly simple for them, but the forgiveness portion, that application process, is very confusing. And our, our banks and our small businesses have told us that a team of lawyers and accountants would be necessary just to help those businesses fill out that forgiveness application, which puts our smallest businesses at a significant disadvantage. Do you believe that Treasury and SBA have the authority to simplify the application for small borrowers? And if not, would you be willing to work with the committee on this issue? First of all, let me just tell you, I personally looked at and helped design the application form, and I've personally reviewed the forgiveness form, and I don't want this to be any more complicated than all of you do. There are requirements in the bill that make it difficult on the forgiveness. I do think in the new law, the safe harbor for people who check the safe harbor will make it significantly easier and won't need to do most of the calculations, and we're coming out with new forms for people who check that. And again, I would also just advertise there is a third party calculator that if you put in all the information, it fills it out in 15 minutes. So you don't need to go 
uh, hire lawyers and accountants, but I can assure you <laughs> we'll work with you very closely. We, we want to make this easy for people to do. And now with the safe harbor, most people will have the benefit of that. Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We just got a call from the lawyers and the accountants. They're upset at what you just said. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rosen. Yeah, I figured out in the beginning it works without the light. Bulb. All right, you can hear me now anyway. I want to thank you, Chairman uh, Rubio, for always taking my call, uh, Ranking Member Cardin, Administrator Carranza, Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, you know, you really provided leadership in helping our small businesses, especially for those of us in Nevada. Uh, you really helped us with that critical support that we needed uh, during these challenging and unprecedented times. Um, I want to really thank you for your in public for your willingness to uh, provide our small Nevada gaming business up and down the state. People think of just the big hotels on the Strip, but it's up and down our state everywhere, and everyone is very very appreciative. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about idle reform. And over, of course, the past few months, the coronavirus pandemic, it's just devastated small business. Nevada, 99% of our business is small business. We also have, unfortunately, the highest unemployment rate, 28%, um, up over 24 percentage points from last year. And so it's clear that our unemployment rate, of course, is a reflection of uh, the overall state of the, that the pandemic has had on small business. My office has directly helped more than 560 of these small businesses with their questions with the CARES Act. I'm going to give a shout out to our small business administrator, Joe Amato. He's done his hundredth, over his hundredth webinar. Uh, I've been able to participate on a lot of those. But the one common complaint that we've received repeatedly is about the SBA's $1,000 per employee cap on idle advance grants, and it's $150,000 cap on the idle loans. That's a 93% reduction from the $2 million level that we authorized in the CARES Act. Many Nevada businesses, of course, have contacted my office telling me that the $150,000 uh, just isn't enough, doesn't provide enough support, and they're going to probably have to permanently close their businesses. So Ranking Member Cardin earlier spoke about this. Uh, these borrowing caps were not the intent of Congress when we passed the CARES Act. Uh, they weren't part of any deal uh, that small business owners thought when they applied for their idle support. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I, others, we've sent a letter recently uh, on the same issue uh, back in April. I've raised it up. I raised it a few weeks ago when we were on the phone. Um, so, Administrator Carranza, following up on the ranking member's question earlier, um, why has the SBA uh, placed that 150000 borrowing limit on the idle loans? How did you come up with that number? And uh, the reason it's funding, why didn't you come back to us for support? Senator Rosen, I appreciate your, your question because it's been raised and I've been d dealing with it personally um, because small businesses approach my office as well. I mean, I get personal emails and follow up on, on their request. So I'm very close to the situation. But I want to reassure every member on this committee that it wasn't an arbitrary number. It was a matter of realizing that we had uh, over 5 million applications in the queue. And, and thanks to this committee, and thank, and thank you, Senator Cardin, for providing the council and the uh, opportunity to speak with you and the chairman about what was in the pipeline, the fact that we had already exhausted the seven billion that we had uh, in the pipeline, and then also uh, what we had available was to ensure that we gave not just something, but based on six months of operating cost. Uh, that's basically how the formula is based, uh, is, is calculated. And um, the average loan at that given time was being realized at about um, $83,000. So we thought, if I can manage that, the the decisions were made that if we could manage the five million um, applicants that were already in the queue that had been waiting for the funds, that we could cover all with the fifty billion su and subsidy. And thousand dollar per employee. That's also been extremely uh, the, difficult. Well, the, the the grant was the same the same calculation in the sense that we looked at a thousand per employee. Um, the first applicants were there were about seven hundred thousand that were sole proprietors. They had one to four employees. Um, and we, again, to allocate 
that many applicants a grant we needed to scale so how to are cover. are you assessing this going forward? So my business is in Nevada, that over nearly 300,000, which uh, only about 83,000 have been able to take advantage of PPP well, we would, or IDLE. Yes, Senator Rosen, we, we didn't want to discourage anyone on that, uh, in that queue, on the IDLE queue, and we sent them a couple of uh, emails indicating and demonstrating the comparison of IDLE what was available and what they could achieve with the PPP program because there were still sufficient funds in that program up to this point. And, and that's the other option we try to clarify that there's another loan option that they can consider uh, if they're in need of um, greater funds. At this time, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are individuals that miscalculated their operating costs from six months to three months. We're revisiting those particular so they businesses. Might have a chance to yes, reply. yes. And so we have about 65,000 of those that we're reconciling um, so that if they needed up to 150,000, we have it available to them. And uh, as of uh, next week, we'll be taking in new applicants as well, the non-AGs. Thank you. We really welcome. we're not a very uh, large ag state. We have some, but not not as much as others, and so that's hurt us uh, disproportionately. But I look forward to working with your office if there's a particular sector that is really problematic. I, I look forward to working Thank with you, you on I that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, just up there, we're coming down the stairs. We have a nearly perfect attendance today. We're going to Senator Hawley, Senator Collins, and then if there's any wrap up items, I'll, I'll ask them, and then we'll send you on your way. Um, so, Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, I've been closely monitoring the implementation of the relief programs, the various relief programs Congress has established. And uh, I, I have to say I'm, I, I'm thrilled given last week's job numbers. I think that the PPP has played a vital role, has been a vital lifeline during the shutdowns, has clearly helped to stop the economic hemorrhaging and uh, put us in a place now uh, for recovery. And so uh, I, I, that is, I think, a, a great success story. I want to thank the chairman for his outstanding work on this. I do have some questions about the idle, that to, following up on what Senator Rosen was just asking about. I'm going to come back to those low. Let me, let me start, Administrator Kronza, with you. Just on the Planned Parenthood issue, Planned Parenthood has 16,000 employees. This is not a gray issue. It's a black and white issue. They, they, they talk about it in all of their organizing documents. I'm just wondering when 37 Planned Parenthood offices, 37 separate offices applied for PPP funds, why did the internal system at the SBA not flag the applications? Senator, our system accepts applications and assigns a loan number and the the loan arrangement is made between the borrower and the um, and, and the lender. So, when you have about five million applications being injected into our system, uh, we don't have a system that flags affiliations or any particular industry. It just assigns a loan number, and that's why it's very important for us that when we uh, when we looked at sectors, and some sectors had certain tendencies and certain uh, loan values, we then, and, and the affiliations were one of them, we started to uh, assess, you know, the value of how they exercised or interpreted the... Uh, so the you, what, you're, what you're telling me is that the SBA didn't have any safeguards in place on, on this particular question. You didn't have any system in place to, to, to flag at that, applications at, at, at like... At that given time, perfect. that's correct. Despite the fact I might add that this the affiliation rule was was pretty fiercely debated as part of the PPP package as part of the CARES package amended several times. Um, it, it, tell me about the the Planned Parenthood affiliates that wrongly receive funds. How many of those has SBA contacted now? At, at this point, I wouldn't be able to speak about a particular loan situation. Um, so why? It, it's proprietary information, and it's. Well, I'm not asking about a loan situation. I'm asking how many you've contacted. The SBA has put out a statement saying that you've contacted the affiliates. You sent letters. It's been publicly reported. Yes, how no, no, how I, many? The office did receive your letters, and uh, we acted accordingly. But at this point, uh, given the detail on a particular bar, it would just not be. A so you can you can confirm for the record that you sent letters to Planned Parenthood affiliates, but you won't tell us how many. Is that that's your testimony? No, I'm saying that uh, the affiliation or any borrower that we are taking a course of action is um, that indeed, I, and I don't talk about the particulars. How many Planned Parenthood affiliates have returned the funds? Again, I have to take the position that I'm not able to 
share that borrower information. At this when point. are you going to be able to? And how are we going to conduct oversight if you won't give us any of this information? I look forward to speaking with you in your office. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry? With you. I, I look forward to uh, meeting with you and discussing the situation. But at this point, I won't be able to speak to it publicly. Well, what, what's different between discussing with me in person and discussing it here when you're under oath? But just to clarify, again, the SBA position, I, I wouldn't be able to um, divulge any of the details or just explain what our our uh, practice and our policy is. Well, how are you going to provide this committee with information about this breach of the rules that are in the statute so that we can conduct oversight? How are we going to conduct our oversight if we don't know any of the details? Uh, and when, since you won't do it now, when will you do well, it? When Senator, will you, what are the guidelines that will, you will follow in disclosing this information? Well, Senator, what I would like to do is to um, review with you the controls that we've put in place and the course of action that we take with all affiliations, not just uh, this okay. particular Okay, we'll follow up with you. For the record, I'd like to state, I, it is important that this committee conduct its oversight of rules that are written in the statute. Mm -hmm. And I want answers about how Planned Parenthood which is it's forbidden by the statute that this Congress wrote and passed into law. It's not a rule. It's not a regulation. It's in the statute. I want to know how it happened that $80 million was diverted to Planned Parenthood affiliates that is plainly not permissible under the statute. This committee has an, an obligation to perform oversight, and I want answers on that. And I will not accept that you can't tell us or that you don't know. So I want answers. So we will follow up with you. We'll follow up with the Department of Justice. But I'm just saying for the record, it will not be acceptable to me that you're not going to tell us, you're not going to get back to us, you're not going to be responsive. No, and Senator, frankly, the pattern of unresponsiveness from the SBA throughout this process has been disturbing, which I've said for the record, and I'll say it again today, and I'm disturbed by it. Mr. Chairman, one other question, if I could, just Senator on Holly, the, I, I, I've, I got, to, I've got to move on. You You've made your position I, clear, I and you're not being responsive. Let me ask you another question while I've got you here. On the idle applications, you answered an earlier question that idle applications are now in the portal. I'd like to know the timeline of when they will be processed. I've had applicants in my state that have waited 80 days, eight zero days, for any kind of a response on their idle application. Senator Rosen was just talking about this, similar problems in her state. When will they be processed? We have repeatedly asked for answers. They can't get answers. I can't get answers. When will they be processed? And when will these good folks get some response to their application? Senator Hawley, I can extract all of the uh, applications that pertain to your particular state, and I can review with you the status of them. At, at this current time, we have about two and a half million applicants that applications that have been processed there's a high number of declines we re, we are reinstating those particular declines be, once they fix their their um, information the other two and a half will be injected by next week so all of the 5.4 million applications that we had in the queue since march will now be in what we call the loan processing portal I'll have visibility when that loan is positioned there and I can share with you exactly where your Loan, loan portfolio stands. I'll, I'll, my time's expired. I'll follow up you on, with you on that. I, I just want to emphasize again that it is absolutely vital for people who have been waiting for 80 days plus I that their application be processed. And they don't care what you label the queue. You're in this queue or that queue. They just want it processed. They need an answer. Mm -hmm. They're waiting on a vital lifeline. So we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. thank you, Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me start by thanking you for the invitation to join your committee today. I also want to say what a rewarding experience it was to work with you, with Senator Cardin and Senator Shaheen in developing the PPP program, which has been of tremendous benefit to more than 4 million small businesses and their employees. I want to turn to our witnesses, and first I want to emphasize the point that many other senators have brought up today, and that is that many small businesses are reaching the end of their eight-week loan period, and yet they are still unable to fully reopen because of state restrictions. For example, in the state of Maine, there are three counties that still are under tough restrictions where they cannot have in-restaurant dining. 
And I want to read to you the words from a restaurant owner in Portland, which really summarizes it well. It's a woman-owned restaurant, a great place to eat. She writes, the PPP is the only thing that has kept us in business up to this point. Our staff has been so grateful. It has not only allowed us to pay them and open for business, but allowed us to pay our rent in full. There's no question without the PPP, we would not be operating right now and would have furloughed all of our staff. With that being said, we did just run out last week. We now have curbside and only six outdoor tables. And we can only serve a maximum of 28 people a night. She writes that she lives in fear of a rainy night, in which case she can't serve anybody in those outside tables. And she says without the state um, easing the restrictions on indoor seating, I just don't see how we can continue much longer. This is a, an extremely viable business that was doing very well until the state restrictions and the coronavirus hit. So we now know that we have $130 billion of funding for this program that remains available. So I want to press you a little bit more. I know you've said that you do think that there should be more support, but would you support allowing small borrowers in heavily affected sectors, such as the tourism industry, that cannot fully reopen because of state restrictions, to seek additional PPP funds, apply again or extend perhaps for another four weeks so that they can just make it through this, this period where they're forced to be closed because they are viable businesses and it's not their fault. Mr. Well, Secretary. First of all, I want to personally thank you for your involvement in this and uh, we've become texting buddies, so all of your help along the way. Uh, I am especially sympathetic to the restaurants. Uh, I would just say we had uh, a large number of restaurant owners and industry people come in and meet with the president, and we heard the 24-week issue, and uh, I'm very pleased that Congress responded to that. Uh, as I said before, I think that restaurants and hotels in particular do need more help. We've, We've taken, taken great, great pride in the bipartisan, bipartisan work. work. So, so if there is support for you and in, in the, the committee, committee on a bipartisan, bipartisan basis, basis, we're very seriously going to look at uh, that issue. And let me just give a pitch on indoor seating, okay? I'm happy that in D.C. they've now allowed restaurants open. I've tried to support restaurants. I don't see why on an indoor basis, socially distanced, that restaurants can't be serving indoors, particularly in parts of the country where COVID is under control. So I agree with you. This distinction between indoor and outdoor seems a bit, uh, a bit random, and I don't know what people would do when it rains. Thank you. I have one technical question, if the chairman would indulge me. It's a very quick question uh, for the secretary. And that is, I'm getting a lot of questions about the timing for seeking forgiveness. And there are some businesses that have gone through the eight weeks, they are reopened, and they would like to close it out now. But they're wondering with the extension to 24 weeks, if they have to wait until the 24 weeks, can they close out at any time? If, you, if you've used all your money, you can apply for forgiveness. The 24 weeks is only meant to be an option for you. If you haven't used your money, specifically if you're not open or otherwise, you, you can extend it. But no, we would encourage people that as they've used all their money properly, please seek forgiveness so we can process these loans and get them off of the books. And that'd be helpful for workload purposes for both of you um, as well. Thank you very much and thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cardin.
Thank you. Since I reserve my time, I'm just going to touch some quick points here. We'll go to the ranking member, has some additional thoughts, and, uh, and we have a vote. It starts at 12.15, so um, we're almost done here, and, and, and uh, really nearly perfect attendance today, which is, we haven't had that before, so I appreciate you both coming in. Uh, just a quick question. After the changes that were made last week with the additional flexibility down to 60 percent for payroll, 24 weeks to pay it back, have we seen businesses that said the old PPP didn't work for me, but the new one does. Have we seen any sort of uptick or any indication that there's more businesses lining up now to use the program as a result of that change? Well, my expectation is that we will definitely see businesses that were on the sidelines and now take it, especially restaurants that had issues. But yes, I would expect we'll see that. But, but, but we, so we just don't know on the nightly numbers if that's been reflected yet? We don't have actual numbers at SBA, but there has been uh, expressions of relief that there is more time. So it's worked well for, for Yeah, I guess the, the, the curiosity is whether, I'm, I'm confident that people that had already gotten a loan or feel better about being able to use what they already have. I'm curious whether there are people out there or businesses out there now uh, who think this works for us and may access this. We'll keep a close eye on that but as we get down the stretch here with about two and a half weeks left before the June 30th cutoff. The observation, and I'm glad you talked about targeted relief and what we do moving forward. One of the things that does concern me is a disparity in, in the recovery. I'll just give you one example of, of what I just read a while back, uh, not long ago, earlier today, on a, what's, what was a uh, recent study estimated. It's pretty shocking. And, and it found that in majority African-American neighborhoods, 95% of small businesses in those neighborhoods had a cash buffer of less than two weeks. In majority white neighborhoods, not white non-Hispanic neighborhoods, 30% had less than two weeks cash on hand. Now, clearly, the 30% in those neighborhoods need help. There's no one disputing that. But 95% versus 30% is a big disparity. And, and, and so one of the things that I think we need to think through as we structure this.
from accessing the information it needs to fulfill uh, something we required in the statute, and that is that they report to Congress. So the CARES Act requires the GAO to issue bi-monthly reports to Congress on agency implementation of the Act, with the first report due on June 25th, which is coming up. At, this is what they're telling us. They're saying that of, of all the agencies, the SBA is, is the only one that has not cooperated and that that lack of cooperation has impacted their efforts to gather information that they need to fulfill uh, the mandated reporting requirement that we put in place in the law. Um, I imagine you've heard the same thing from them. What, what's happening there? Because th we need to get that solved. Chairman, I spoke to the Chairman Quigley yesterday, um, and we, from the appropriations, and I, I expressed to him that by next week we should be able to resolve some data that uh, his um, staff has been asking for. So I told him that we would be very um, punctual with it and as thorough as we possibly can. So we um, had a meeting of the minds yesterday and clarified what the delay that, the reasons for the delay. But that should not continue. So, so your expectation is that at some point next week, yes, this should no longer be an issue? Because we're, we're preparing the data for the Data Act. Um, and so that's in about a week or two, max. Yes. I mean, I'll keep you posted on, on when that's going to be. Yeah, we just need to get that fixed. Um, that, that, that's something that's in the law, and it reflects poorly Absolutely. on the, okay. Um, ranking member. Well, let me thank both our witnesses. Uh, again, uh, this was very, very helpful. A couple observations. Uh, first, on the IDLE program, you're hearing from all the members of this committee that it's not working at the level that we anticipated it. I think we can understand that initially there were certain administrative decisions that had to be made because of the volume. But two things have happened that are really not acceptable, and that is people, businesses have been left in the dark as to the status of their idle loans and have been delayed beyond it being useful for them to plan their businesses during this period of time. That needs to be corrected. Uh, and then and secondly, the cap that was put on, the 150000 really makes no sense today. I, I'll be very surprised if the final numbers of loans given out under IDLE uh, come anywhere close to the capacity that you have as authorized by Congress. So I just urge you to look at correcting the program as quickly as possible from the timely status of applications and the dollar volume. The second thing, there seems to be a growing consensus of a need for a second round uh, for small business. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I, in, in response to one of our, our uh, members, I couldn't agree with you more. We had to get money out quickly on the first round. The second round, we could be more discerning. So I hope that we can start that conversation now uh, about how we could configure a second round for small business. I understand you might have beyond small businesses, but it'd be helpful, I think, to try to get those discussions started now because as the Senate normally operates, as Congress normally operates, we usually get panicked around a deadline. So it'd be nice if we could flush this out a little bit earlier. We, we took a little bit earlier lead on small business than the other parts of the CARES Act, and it allowed us to have, I think, a more thoughtful uh, draft legislation than in some of the other sections. The third point, is that it seems to me in regards to those that have, uh, have criminal records, there is a consensus. And I would hope that this week we could get all of us together and, and try to resolve that issue in a broader manner as, as we've talked about at this hearing. The, the last point I want to mention is, the, uh, is Senator Howley's comments in regards to the affiliate rules. I couldn't disagree with him more as it relates to the conclusionary statements he made in regards to Planned Parenthood. And I appreciate the administrator not talking about a specific case, which I think is appropriate. So I, I agree with you on that. But let me just point out, one of the reasons we would like to get more granular data so that we can understand the scope of the issues. We wrestled with how to deal with affiliates for the new categories of businesses that qualified for the PPP program that didn't qualify for the traditional 7A program, including the nonprofit and veterans organizations. And we specifically put the provision in the CARES Act 
that said the provisions applicable to affiliations under Section 121.103 of Title 13, Code of Federal Regulation, to a nonprofit organization or veterans organization in the same manner as with respect to a small business concern. So you're, we expected you to use the same affiliate rules that you use currently to qualify for 7A loans for the for-profit community for the new eligible PPP 7A uh, borrowers. So what it'd be helpful for us, and then we were concerned when publicity arose under the uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, that we don't start imposing an ideological test on affiliation. And uh, the Democratic members of the Senate wrote a letter in May to you saying it's critical that the SBA implement the PPP as C Congress directed without ideological efforts to treat certain nonprofit organizations different from others. So I, I just really want to put that in the record in regards to Senator Holly's comments, but it does underscore how important it would be for us to get the granular information as to the number of loans that are issued to affiliates and so that we could get, get a feel for how many organizations would not have qualified if we included all the affiliates in the numbers of, for the 500. But it's also true in the NIC code exception. It'd be nice for us to have that granular information. It might also be helpful for us to have that information in regards to those who use the alternative tests for determining a number of employees to qualify for, for a small business loan. So the more of that type of information we can get, we can then analyze what those exceptions mean. But we should not draw a conclusion that one particular organization was treated differently than any of the other organizations because of their organizing mission. And that's one thing that I would just urge us to be very careful that we don't start to discriminatory implement uh, ways of, uh, of, of implementing laws that are passed by and Congress. I Senator, and I look forward to um, meeting with you and discussing the, the process that we've... Um, Thank prepared. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, look, we're very grateful that you came in today. It's important. As you saw, the level of interest is extraordinary in the Senate, across the country, and, um, and, um, and obviously we've got some follow-up to work through, but we appreciate uh, the answers you gave us here today. They're important. Uh, as a housekeeping item, the, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks, and any statements or questions for the record should be submitted by Wednesday, July 1st at 5 p.m. And with that, thank you both, and this hearing is adjourned.